Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Let's let's change a little bit the topic. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about applications of uh, quantum computing, and in particular in machine learning. This is going to be a, a machine learning talk. And uh, for preparing it, I I did this exercise. I thought, let's take the last year, the last period of 365 days, and let's see what was in the news about machine learning. And you know, every once in a while you hear some news that something has been done, so on. But uh, like doing this retrospective really shocked me because there's so much that has been done this year. We've gone from like generating high resolution images of faces of people that do not exist to using machine learning in, uh, in medicine, in helping um, predicting diseases. To also, it's also been used to, as a tool in other areas of research to do actual discoveries. And then the list goes on and on and on. We have like now presenters that are not real. We have AI creating art. We have AI writing coherent text. And even a couple of days ago, we had a, a machine uh, making, well, competing in a, in a debate competition against humans. And this actually, well, seeing this with a bit of like perspective makes you think, wow, like from here in into a couple of years, there's nothing that deep learning is not going to be able to do, right? Well, actually, in this talk, I want to convince you that this uh, may not be quite the case. And let me put you an example of it. Let's think that you are an expert in deactivating bombs, okay? Something that most of you are, probably. And um, let's, uh, well, you want to innovate and you want to implement machine learning and, 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 um, and try to, to, to make your, your work easier by using machine learning. So you have uh, this deep learning algorithm, you develop this deep learning algorithm that takes uh, information about uh, the particular bomb. For instance, a very important thing is, as, you, as everyone knows, the color of the cables, right? And um, well, then you use, this, you, you use the algorithm to predict which cable you have to cut. So the answers you get, are something like this. Uh, okay, and cool, you train it, it works, fine, perfect. But then it goes, the application, into a real problem. So you are faced with a real bomb that if you cut the wrong cable, it explodes, and you just get this information. Well, I don't know you, but probably I would like a bit more information, right? Maybe, I don't know, how sure are you about this? Uh, isn't it that, well, were you more or less the same sure, but just a little bit less that it was a, the blue cable? I just wanted a bit more, you know? And uh, it turns out that uh, these questions, like how sure is an algorithm about a specific prediction, is a very difficult question to answer in the standard framework of deep learning. The reason for this is that uh, deep learning, as we, we know it now, is mostly based on, um, on optimization. It's based on calculus. And these questions do not fit that well. Uh, in contrast, there's other, well, there's people aware of this, and um, there's other frameworks in which uh, machine learning operates that uh, have a more, natural frame, are a more natural framework for these sorts of questions, like a probability theory. And that's what, I, what I'm going to talk about, this Bayesian approach to machine learning. Uh, the word Bayesian, should, I, I don't want to, to, to scare people here, it's just using these sorts of theorems about probability distributions uh, this is essentially Bayes' theorem, which tells you what is the probability of uh, some event occurring given that we have some previous information A, and how to compute it given other information that is more easily accessible. And this has a, a very nice uh, application in machine learning. You can think of what is the probability that a label is given given that I know some data. I've been training, I, know some previous, I have some previous experience, for example, and I, compute, I can compute that from quantities that are more accessible, more accessible in my data set, for example. And now the kinds of answers that we get are still not, a, like, maybe not completely convincing, but at least we are getting a bit more information about the solution that is being output. With something like this, I would be a bit more convinced on cutting the right cable, you know? Uh, okay, and one, so one, so 
One approach to this is, uh, well, doing it in classical computers. It, the people have been working on this and have been doing research. And this kind of Bayesian training of deep, ne deep neural networks can be done. Uh, here, I just will have to warn you that here comes uh, the boring math, but I will try to keep it um, simple. Essentially, the way of doing uh, Bayesian training of deep neural networks is thanks to this analogy between each uh, layer in the network and something that is called a Gaussian process. And the important thing about Gaussian processes that we need to know is that, well, we assume that there is a global uh, Gaussian distribution underlying the outputs of each label, and then we want to compute this quantity, the post the, what is called the posterior distribution, which is essentially the probability distribution of some label, Y star, given that I have some input, X star, and some training set which with, uh, tra with uh, instances and labels. And this, uh, if we assume this Gaussian processes, has this form here, it's just a, a normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution with uh, some mean and some variance that are given by uh, this formula. The important thing here, I wonder if this, I can point with this. No, no. okay. Anyway, the scale here is an important quantity that is called the covariance, uh, the covariance matrix. And it's essentially uh, a matrix that you build out of your data, out of your data up, uh, by applying uh, what is called a covariance function to each, of the, uh, if each uh, combination of data points. And a very, a very nice thing is that for each layer, you can compute this covariance matrix just using the information from previous layers. So you can do, you can do this training in a recursive way. Uh, awesome, then, so this thing exists, so why is not everyone using it? Well, it turns out that, uh, well, it's not like super hard, it's not, uh, it's not MP hard to compute this inverse, so remember that we need this covariance function, with this covariance matrix, but we have a power to the minus one, we have to invert that big matrix. And this inversion, uh, yeah, it's not uh, super, super hard, but, it, but still, for very big data sets, for a large amount of points, the number of operations that one has to do goes with the third power of the number of, of data points. And this, uh, at some point, becomes a bit intractable. Uh, and when, so, so, so what? What can we do now? Here is the point where quantum computing can help. So why don't we do something like this? We encode these vectors y and uh, this, this k star into quantum states, and we interpret our matrix as a quantum operator. Can we now, now do uh, something easier? Well, it turns out that yes. Luckily, there was uh, this algorithm by Hasidim, uh, Harrow, Hasidim, and Lloyd, developed in 2009, that allows to do exactly this. So you have a system A, times x equals b, like a linear system of equations. And there exists a quantum algorithm that retrieves the solution, this, this vector x, which has a very similar form to this kl to the minus 1 times y. So we can do that part on the one hand. And on the other hand, we also have uh, quantum algorithms to perform this inner product uh, in an efficient way. So we can do this. Uh, and that's what we were, well, these are the sorts of results we were uh, connecting in order to have an end-to-end -end quantum algorithm to do this Bayesian training of deep neural networks. Uh, what we did, did we do, essentially, this is in, in this paper over here that we released uh, like half a year ago. Um, essentially, we need just two ingredients, which is first, the recursive formula uh, for the covariance matrix of a layer uh, as a function of the covariance matrix of the previous layer. And then we need, and this, uh, it's, it's true that it's not a trivial thing, but we would need uh, the initial covariance matrix, the covariance matrix of the first layer, encoded as a quantum state, which, uh, I mean, in principle, you, you, you could, for, for instance, compute classically and then prepare the, such a state. But anyway, this, this we don't care at least in, in this project, we don't care too much about it. 
Given these two things, uh, what we were able to do is to build an approximation of the covariance matrix of the last layer. Again, well, we, well, we built this. And then what we also built was the time evolution operator under this approximation. So this uh, is uh, essentially, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, this could be encoded into a quantum circuit. Uh, or, or, or simulated by, uh, via Hamiltonian simulation and could be applied in uh, the HHL algorithm to do the matrix inversion. So uh, essentially, yeah, we take this state encoding the, the initial covariance matrix and we develop the, evolution, the time evolution operator that allows us to um, do the matrix inversion in a, in a quantum way and uh, compute the, the inner products. So to obtain the parameters of the distribution that we want to fit the data to. Uh, and not only that, this was more theoretical, but the, also we did uh, some sort of experiments. Uh, bear in mind that these are experiments done by theoreticians, so uh, they, may, uh, they may not satisfy real experimentalists. But, uh, well, we were, we were uh, coding the core part of the algorithm, this HHL part. We were implementing it in various uh, frameworks, uh, in Rigetti Forest and in IBM Q. And we were doing simulations of uh, the run of the algorithm for invert inverting big matrices, as big as four by four, uh, and running the protocols in noisy simulators uh, uh, using different, uh, uh, different kinds of noise. In, the, in, in this figure, I have both gate noise, which is an X operator applied after every gate of the circuit with, uh, with some probability. And you see that is awful, essentially, because uh, of the, 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 the number of gates that you have in the circuits is quite big. So even for low probabilities, you have a lot of X operators applying on your, on your state. And then we have this measurement noise, which is just a readout error when you do measurements. And this is not, a, not, not, not that bad. Not only that, we also did runs in uh, real quantum computers, both of IBM and Rigetti. And in the case of uh, IBM, we got particularly nice results. Uh, in particular, well, we got the here, well, I'm plotting this probability of success under a swap test, uh, just not to make too, too much fuss about it. Uh, this can translate into a fidelity with a desired target state. And in the case of IBM, we get fidelities of about 78%, which is, uh, which is pretty encouraging. So yeah, that's, uh, that's essentially all I wanted to tell you. Just to, to wrap up quickly, uh, I hope I've uh, uh, well, the takeaway, the takeaway message is that not all machine learning is deep learning, and actually there's other frameworks and other, and other ways of doing machine learning that may be more useful for particular applications. Um, in this context, Bayesian deep learning uh, based in Gaussian processes, uh, it is useful. You can train very large networks, but it's also classically hard. Nevertheless, for the, class, for the hard parts, we can resort to quantum computing and have some sort of uh, hybrid classical quantum algorithms to do the full training. And in this respect, uh, the experiments that we have conducted are, are encouraging, as I said, speci especially in the IBM platform. But still, there's a lot, to be, uh, a lot to be done. The matrices that we could invert in real computers uh, were not bigger than two by two. So probably it would take less time maybe doing it by hand. But anyway, uh, all the tools are there. Uh, we did everything open source, all the codes, so, so they are up to, uh, available for generalization or, or, or further modifications. And uh, I guess it's a, it's a matter of time that uh, we have application of these algorithms in, uh, in, uh, in more realistic scenarios. And that's all, thank you very much. <laughs>